Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. On the show today, I have Sam Reddy. Sam is the founder of a company called Musee Live, which is a platform for music teachers working online, providing an all-in-one resource for video calls, materials, cloud storage, and everything you need for your lessons. I've always loved interviewing musician entrepreneurs on this podcast because as we go barreling toward the future in classical music, I truly believe that there will be more and more musicians who take on entrepreneurship in a variety of ways, thinking about careers in a completely new light. In our conversation, Sam and I talk about entrepreneurship and being a creator as a musician today. Sam shares great advice on ways musicians can create and earn money in their careers outside of their performing endeavors. We also talk about what life was like going to Berkeley School of Music and how going there was a catalyst for him to start a business before he graduated. Sam explored a lot of different avenues and he shares how he blended all of his interests to create a career tailored entirely to his own interests and skills. But before we get started, I want to make sure you know the big news coming your way from Crushing Classical. Starting in March, Janet Ingle, oboist and author of the book The Happiest Musician, which is out now on Amazon, will be taking over Crushing Classical podcast. It's time for me to pass the baton to continue the conversation of creating a career you love on your own terms in classical music. The next episode will be with Janet in two weeks, and we'll go into the whole story. In the meantime, Stay tuned, stay subscribed to Crushing Classical Podcast, and share this podcast with all of your classical musician friends. Let's get started. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for coming on Crushing Classical. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This is Sam Reddy. Sam, I um, I invited Sam on the show today because you invented a really, really cool business platform. Thank you. I guess you call it an app, right? Do you call it an app or it's more like a website? Yeah, it's, it's more of a, well, it's technically, I suppose, a web app, but we just end up calling it a platform because it's right. universal. So it works on any kind of device that you own. So Awesome. So we're going to talk all about your Musi Live, which is a supportive um, platform for, for music teachers. It, the, the stuff, the features it has, like, phenomenal. I, I can't wait to tell you all, for you to tell us all about that. But I'm dropping the needle on this um, conversation because... I just posted something on Facebook a little while ago arguing about student loan debt <laughs> because <laughs> Dave Ramsey did a video or he, I guess he takes callers on his show. And mm-hmm. some woman called in and said like her son is a tuba student at a conservatory and he's looking at taking out $280,000 worth of student <laughs> loan debt. And of course, Dave Ramsey, like I think his head exploded a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that that's fair. <laughs> And um, so I had to share that video. And then like right now there's about 45 comments under the video and it's like lighting up my Facebook profile. And so when we just got on the call, we started talking about that. And that's one of the things that I have on my list to talk about with you because you went to Berkeley school, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Berkeley school of music in Boston. Yep. So, and that was the first thing you said was like, that's the best thing about Berkeley is that you had a lot of classes in other areas not specifically performing playing your instrument right so tell us a little bit about that because I think I think that some schools are trying to catch up with with it but Berkeley seems to me like miles ahead of most educational institutions for music yeah I I mean like I'm a bit biased of course because I I did go there but I I think that's true and they've even shown it in the last couple of years they bought Boston Conservatory So now the Boston Conservatory is part of Berkeley. And I think that what they're really trying to show is, unfortunately, but the truth is, you don't make money playing music. And I think that that's a statement that people just need to start to learn to accept and not try to get angry or upset or discouraged about. It's just live with it and you'll be okay. (laughs) Right. Um, What about like, besides orchestral players or I'm like in the top yep. of the orchestra that's probably your 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 like caveat right yeah yes exactly yeah and and like you know I've you've got friends that got to go on tour with like Beyonce and things like that so it's like yeah they'll make some money 
make, making music, but we're talking about like one in 5,000 at right. the best music schools in the world. So um, it is, if you want to make a real career with music, one of the great things that Berkeley did was basically explain to us pretty early on that you need to be, you need to wear every hat and you need to be willing to do things that you didn't really think were in your job description. So if you're going to write music, well, writing music for yourself is great, but writing music for other people is where you're actually going to get paid. Or if you like technology, maybe spin your interest in music and technology into something together. One, you know, some of the professors at our school, one of them um, had a company called Sonic Bids, and that was about basically booking bands to small, uh, you know, small venues. And, you know, we sold that for a decent amount of money and he came back as the entrepreneur professor. So, oh. yeah. So like there's other, uh, there's new and there's new and other avenues to really make it in the music world. But I think you have to have to be willing to explore multiple at the same time. And I think that's something, I mean, most musicians are pretty good about that because, you know, you're dedicated to your craft and you practice a lot and, you know, you can't get to that level without having that kind of determination. But we're also very guilty of having sort of, I want to do this and this is the only thing I want to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think just kind of accepting that it's the the outcome's not really what you're, th- it might not be what you're imagining it to be, but it doesn't make it better or worse. You know, like I, I teach music, I have a software company, so I still get to play my guitar every day, but I also, you know, get to live and, <laughs> and not have to deal with the problems of, of, you know, trying to scrape by playing a gig here and there. So exactly. I think, you know, it's important to, to really think about your options and try to just kind of reach your hand into everything. And when you're in college, that's sort of the best time to be doing that because it's sort of free reign to go and explore tons of different topics. I actually changed my major three or four times when I was in college. Really? I started, really? yeah, I started off with performance and production then dropped the performance right away because I just had no interest in getting a piece of paper that said, congratulations, you can play the guitar. Um, <laughs> didn't really seem <laughs> to have much value to me. Yeah. Um, we did it. I did a semester or two of the production and it really wasn't what I was expecting it to be. It wasn't, I was just, I didn't love it. So I figured that's probably not what I should do. I tried film scoring for a semester that was fun, but it wasn't really, it wasn't my thing. And then I sort of ended up making up my own degree, so to speak. They have a department, it's called professional music. And the idea is that if you have a pretty solid idea of what you want to do, you can pull together classes from all over the college and bring them together as long as they have a focus, you know, and you can sort of make a degree out of that. So for me, it was technology. So I was trying to incorporate music and technology and not in like a like not listening to music like a spotify or something but like performing and practicing Mm -hmm. so it was had more of like an impact to the students and the people that were actually in the college right right um were there classical musicians in the school too yeah so there were but even before they bought boston conservatory there are classical musicians that go to berkeley Mm -hmm. um uh, not not as many because it is a contemporary school, um, but they they are there. So and now there's an entire you know they right. own Boston Conservatory, so that half the school is uh, classical, and I think they actually have dance now as well. That's um, smart though, because now they can integrate what they've been doing in the more popular genres mm-hmm. into the classical. Hopefully, that will start to blend. Yeah, I think that was exactly the the purpose was. I think the idea was like at Berkeley, you have to take like classical theory classes and Mm -hmm. like counterpoint and all that kind of stuff. And I think what the the logic behind it was, well, let's get the best counterpoint teachers and the best classical teachers, which were all over the conservatory. But let's also provide another way for the conservatory students to learn about music, which is more of the contemporary, like the film scoring. And we used to do like in film scoring, you used to go over to the conservatory and be like, Hey guys, can I borrow you to work on, like play on my score? Oh. So now it's all one in the same. So it's a little bit more, you know, homogenous. So it's, it's a bit more, um, you know, friendly for everyone to kind of branch out and meet new people and get different experiences. 
Yeah, I love that. And I, I really think that unless um, the school is set up to, I mean, the, what's cool about this is the school is set up as who they are mm -hmm. to bring these ideas together. Like, I feel like when a conservatory or a music school is like, oh, shoot, we have to throw together an entrepreneurship class <laughs> to try to keep up with the Joneses, you know? Yeah. I think the kids who are there already have a certain context around like, I only want to perform. Maybe I'll teach if I can't win the job I want. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of such, it's such a disempowered approach because it doesn't mean you can't perform. It just yeah. means let's be realistic about how you make money. And one of the things I, I mean, listen, I'm coming from a converted point of view. Like I mm -hmm. used to, I mean, I was that person in school that was like, I only want to play my instrument. I don't even want to teach. I don't want to talk to anybody about working in a school at all. No way. You know, I want to be in an orchestra. Like I had major blinders on. And now I see, especially because not, I mean, I've, I created a performing career, but a lot of my, um, my friends who were in school didn't. And mm -hmm you know, and I, I see the, the space, I know what's going on. And like, the other thing that I really realized was in the last maybe two or three years was how much fun it is to have playing be something that you're doing just because you love it. Like after, after you're doing it because you need to make money yeah. <laughs> and you blend those two things together, it can kill a lot of the fun for you. And for sure. I, when I, when I started my ensemble, I was like, Whoa, like, I didn't even know that three hours of rehearsal went by. Like this was yep. so much fun, you know? Um, if you can get paid for doing that kind of stuff and get paid, you know, or maybe it's not a ton of money, but everyone gets paid for their time. That's probably mm -hmm. the most ideal scenario. But like you just mentioned this songwriter right before you, I hit record, who is like a multimillionaire. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's arguably the most prolific. I think he's like a three or four, like, you know, besides the Beatles, I think he has the most number one hits out of anybody in the world. And, what's and his no, name? Max Martin, which nobody most knows him. Don't know him. He's worth about $260 million, you know, which is a nice okay. chunk of change. And yeah. he's worked with everybody. I mean, Backstreet Boys all through the nineties and the early two thousands, he was doing all of the Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears and NSYNC and all that. But he's yeah, worked okay. with, you know, like re more recently, like The Weeknd, who's, you know, arguably one of the biggest artists now and Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande, Katy Perry. So he he doesn't perform anything. You know, he's not out on stage becoming super famous, but he's he is in the thick of it and he's getting paid to do it a lot. Yeah, yeah. And like <laughs> classical musicians, myself included, have always been like, oh, pop music. I mean, it's so simple. There's like five chords. <laughs> I mean, but if you could, if you can write something and, and, you know, yeah. make millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? can't you? beat them, join them, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, so. I mean, I also had a professor in college who was a jingle writer um, and he was quite literally a billionaire um, wow. because he wrote the jingles from McDonald's and Staples, Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, like every jingle you heard, he wrote it. Wow. Um, and that's like one of those things where it's like, yeah, they're super simple. Like he would even tell you himself, he has like, you know, 10 backing tracks that he uses and he just changes the words on most of them. And there you go, a jingle. And wow. it's that kind of thing where it's like, you don't, you know, there's other avenues in, in the music world to make real money with it. And you just have to be creative. And these people, they get to write music every single day of their lives. Yeah. So whether or not they're writing an orchestra every day, Probably not, but it, it gives them the ability where if when he wants to take a month off and go write an orchestra, he can, he, he can, you know, he, can, he doesn't need to worry about making ends meet and trying to fill in his passions. Yeah. So, you know, I you think know what that I love about that, it, it just, it reflects the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you look at what is being purchased, what is being, where is music really valued to the point where you can make multi-millions? It's popular yeah. music and commercials and yeah. like not to, not to lessen the art form of what we do as classical musicians at all, because it's a beautiful art form. Absolutely. But it's not, it's certainly not the most popular thing on the planet. So, yeah. I mean, what if you could have a combination of the things so that you could live a really awesome life? I think the other thing, the other piece of the puzzle, like what we're talking about here, kind of behind the scenes is what if you could make extraordinary amounts of money? Like, mm -hmm. what would that do for your life? What would that do for your 
freedom in your, yeah. in your life. You know what I yeah, mean? You, so. you can do anything you want at that point. You can retire yeah. really early and spend the rest of your life writing avant-garde, uh, totally. <laughs> you know, four hour long pieces of music. If that's what you want to do, then cool. But yeah. you can't start by writing avant-garde four hour long pieces of music and expect anybody to care. So, exactly. you know, and I think there's some, you know, there's, there are ways to take your skills and apply them. Like I have some friends who are classical pianists and they work for Disney. So they work for Disney writing and r- arranging. Uh, Disney did something recently called like Disney acapella. And it was a lot of the Disney soundtracks, but they were re-recorded as acapella versions for, you know, for sing-along and stuff. And so one of my friend's job was to re-record a bunch of the famous Disney songs. And she's a classically trained pianist. And, you know, so she has her skills, like she needs to be, you know, a monster on the piano, but she also has the business sense to get into a job where they're going to pay her a good amount of money to do exactly what she wanted to do. Right. So, you That's know. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love that. So um, how did you, um, you know, end up on the path that you're on where you're, you're learning guitar and you changed your major a few times. What had you start going towards the tech side and building the business that you have now? Yeah. So it was sort of twofold. So my dad's always been in technology. So that's always been, he was a musician before that. So it sort of those two things in my brain sort of went side by side. Um, and then it was actually came out of like a personal need. So when I was at college, I was having a hard time keeping up with I mean, everything. So the big thing about Berkeley is you don't just have performance classes. You still have to do your math, your science, your all of the other things to get your degree. Um, and so what I needed was something to organize my practice material specifically. You know, I had no problem like getting my homework done and everything. But when you're given like on the first week of school, they give you a big packet of material and basically tell you have this done by the last week of school. And for me, that's, that's not helpful because (laughs) I'm going to be like, okay, so on the last week of school, I will practice this entire packet for 30 (laughs) hours a day and hope it works. So after making that mistake once I was like, well, I need something that's like a, a a system that can keep this all organized. So it started off as just a, a, a personal pet project of, trying to come up with a way to organize material based on how important it was and when it needed to get done. And then when I jumped from major to major through the school, trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do, because like I played in a band for a couple of years while I was there. And I, for, you know, for a while I thought that was my thing. And then that came crumbling down pretty quick. So it, you know, it rose and fall just as fast. So I figured if I can come up with a system that will help me organize everything this might be useful for other people at the school too. So we took an entrepreneur class at the the college that they were offering and it was called the startup lab. And it was, I think it was the first year they offered it. Um, And what was really neat, it was actually in conjuncture with MIT. So yeah, so one of the professors in the class was an MIT professor and the other professor was a Berkeley professor. So you had both sides of the coin and they brought, you know, entrepreneurs and speakers into the class to sort of kind of get that entrepreneurial mindset going. And so when, when I was in that class, we kind of flushed out the entire idea, made like a basic prototype, mostly just using like pen and paper and like images and just sort of building the concept like a storyboard. And then I brought it to my dad as just like a, Hey, this is a neat thing I'm working on. And he was like, well, you know, I could probably build you an actual prototype that really wouldn't take very long. And you can see if it works. And so we ended up, I think we were the only project in the class that actually went through and executed the, the final thing. And that ended up becoming my capstone project for, for college in general. So the, it was, yeah, it was really good. The two of us, we just started working on it and coming up with these concepts. And by the time we were done, we had a a cool practice app. It was something you could input all the material you needed to work on you could give it a preference, basically just rate each thing one through 10 and like whether or not it needed, it was like a short-term goal or a long-term goal. And then it would render you a practice routine, sort of like a gym app would. Um, And you could go through that and it tracked all your practice progress. And, and that sort of just kicked off the whole idea of like, Oh, 
well, maybe there's a bit more to this. I can still focus on my music without actually playing my instrument all the time. Um, and then the first people to try it, like the first trials we had were Berkeley. So mm -hmm. we got it right into the bass department and some of the other departments in the school, they tried it out. Um, and that gave us all the feedback and everything we needed. And we, we ran with that and we ran that company for, um, you know, four or five years. So it turned into a company, like, cause you had to keep maintaining the site and everything. Yeah. Did, <laughs> yeah, people buy, did you get paid for it? Yeah. So we, what we ended up doing is we realized pretty quickly that, um, private studios would, would like something that would for their students to use to, to manage all their practice material. Uh -huh. So we added a couple of more features to it that would allow like basic studio management, you know, like okay. a calendar and a scheduling tool and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, and then as it grew, it really started to grow. So by the end it had billing, invoicing, file sharing, uh, it, it became pretty complicated with the whole, whole infrastructure, but we were then selling it to private studios. So they would use it to schedule and set up all their lessons and organize all their materials. And then that would be sent to the students who had this like practice generator that would allow them to use that to, to keep track of what they were working on. That's so cool. And you got to start making money with a real business before you even graduated. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we, it was rolled out basically as I graduated. So okay. it was sort of like, as I walked out the doors, I had something in my hand that was like tangible in a way that, you know, we started immediately going to studios around Boston. You know, it was pretty, um, you know, cold call style, just show up at the studio and be like, here's a flyer about what we do. Um, <laughs> so I was basically went to every lesson studio in Massachusetts and New England and wow. was trying to knock on doors and get people interested in the product. That's so cool. That's so cool. And so, and out of that came Musi Live apparently, right? Yeah. So we ended up, we did that one for a couple of years. It didn't take off to the degree that we had hoped. So it, it did its thing. It sort of worked out, but you know, we were, we wanted to grow a real huge, you know, big business with tons of employees and, you know, the, you know, yeah. make the dream happen. Um, so we kind of messed around with some other ideas for a while. We had, uh, we built an app for your phone that was basically able, it was like a deck of flashcards and then you would play something and then it would listen to what you played and like rate it against what was on the flashcard. Um, so we did things like that, a lot of like experimental technologies. And then in early 2019, I actually had an idea that was slightly different than what Musi is now. The, the original concept was actually to target lessons for parents. So we had noticed that there were a lot of parents whose kids take lessons and the parents would always be like, oh man, I wish I took lessons. Or I used to play when I was a kid, but I haven't played in like 20 years or something. And the common problem sort of came down to parents don't have enough time in their day to schedule like a weekly 30, 60 minute lesson where they get up and go to a studio and take a lesson. And there's a lot of parents who just don't want to do that either. Like that's just, they don't have any interest in taking lessons again in that format. Yeah. So we sort of built what was an on-demand tutoring service. And so the idea was that you could come onto the platform click request lesson, and then using a fancy little algorithm, it would basically assign you to a teacher. And then the teacher would accept the lesson, sort of like DoorDash for music lessons in a way. So because, you just take one when you're feeling like it? Yeah. And it, was, and it was also pay by the minute. So the student had full control over the lesson instead of the teacher. So we were really shifting the way that lessons are conducted. And so the student basically chose that sometimes they chose the teacher more often. It just picked the teacher that was best suited for them or if not, whoever was available at that time. Yeah. And, and it was a great way for teachers to make extra income because if you have a student cancel or you have a gap in your schedule, you could have this program open on your computer and you could be taking, you know, on demand lessons and you would be getting paid for however long those sessions ran for. So it was the original intent was to make another avenue of income for teachers, but also create a really, really easy sort of no friction way for somebody to take a music lesson. And then that would also apply to like college students who might need some tutoring in 
a part of their subject or something. They could hop on and they could get a, a you know professional teacher to tutor them for 20, 30 minutes. And the nice thing, because it was pay by the minute, it was whenever you felt like you got the information you needed, you could just end the call and you would just charge for however long it was. Oh. So yeah, it was Did very students, different. For students, yeah, because I can't imagine me like as a student, like, okay, that's all I wanted to know. Like, yeah. <laughs> I guess probably they would, it was an hour long or 30 minutes long or something like that. Yeah, and so know. it yeah, it ended up being kind of random. It was, really? it was whatever the student need. Sometimes it was literally just a question that was like, Hey, oh. I'm doing this worksheet. And I, what the heck is that? And the teacher would be like, Oh, it's this, this, and this. And it would be like a five minute lesson. And oh, the really? student like, Hey, thank you. Bye. And they would just, that was it. Or sometimes it was a full, you know, half hour lesson and you did, you know, a, a, all the material and everything that you would expect. Um, and it, but it, what we were really focusing on is just giving people flexibility uh -huh. because we were seeing that there were a lot of people who wanted to take music lessons, but had no consistent schedule where that would be a realistic option. Mm -hmm. So if you had, you know, if you just put the kids to sleep and you have 30 minutes to kill, you could jump on and take a lesson. And if you need to cut the lesson, like right then and there, cause the kids wake up, you can just like, Oh, sorry, I've got to go. Bye end the call and you both get the value. So you don't feel like you paid $50 for your lesson, but you only got to take half of the lesson. Um, right. You paid for what you got. And that what's kind of cool about that is like you said, sometimes the kids might go to bed at eight. Sometimes it yep. might be 30 mm -hmm. and then they, then they have the flexibility to do. Yeah, that. exactly. Or you're working late or you get home early or it's the weekend right. or whatever it was. It was, it just created that flexible, you know, idea for people who wanted to learn right but with anything timing seems to be key so it rolled out in january of 2020 mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had a bit of test pilot and stuff through 2019 which like to prove the concept and got everything working and people um but by march or maybe mid-february um the whole landscape had completely changed so it, it stopped being as much useful for the on-demand sessions, whereas every teacher who was already on the platform, they all asked for the same thing, was can we have our own students on here? Because we need to be able to teach our kids virtually now. And we fortunately had already built all of the technology for the video chat and the file sharings and all of that stuff and like everyone's accounts and so that infrastructure was already in place. So it was really just a, a little bit of tweaking our messaging, so to speak. So that's great. Yeah, we got really, really lucky with the, the time because essentially we were able to say, well, yes. And so we were within probably two or three weeks, we were able to convert the platform from on-demand tutoring to more like a virtual music studio. Right. Um, and then that sort of became like an obvious uh avenue to to attack and so we we just ran with that and that's what we've been doing now ever since that's so cool and i love i mean some of the things that you told me are on it like i mean first of all the file sharing and that it goes to a cloud right after i mean how yeah. many people are downloading and <laughs> yeah. uploading and sharing a google drive link yeah. and all of these things because i mean most of the time if your students recorded in person they were in charge of recording it. They had their own device to record that lesson. And then they would, but now online, the teacher is in charge of everything. Well, you really. can allow the student to record it. But, yeah. you know, if you wanted to do go that extra mile, you know, now you're creating some practice tools and other things for them. Yep. And it became a totally different thing. And so now it solves a lot of problems in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. The whole idea now is like everyone always, you know, the good quality audio video is, is the number one priority. Yeah. Um, but that was something that we'd already done. So because of the original intent, so it needed that right off the bat. So fortunately that was something we didn't need to stress over because right. we, already, we did it before we even knew we needed it really. Um, yeah. And then everything else is there to create really higher quality lessons because a big issue you're seeing with these things, like you're saying, is you can, if your student records a lesson or you share a file or you send them a chat message, on most of these platforms that people are using, those things get deleted as soon as the lesson is over. 
or the student has to download them all onto their computer or something. Mm -hmm. And now they've got gigabytes and gigabytes of files on their laptop that they're not really sure what to be doing with them. Right. So our logic was if you store it all in the cloud and you convert the student's accounts to be like a practice room, then when the student logs in, they can log in from any device at any time in the week. And they can have access to every lesson note that you've ever sent them, every assignment. They have recording tools and practice timers and all that kind of stuff. And it keeps everything in one spot. So kids don't have to be pestering their mom for their email to like download the emails or something yeah. or, just, you know, filtering through five different Dropbox files. And it's one of those things where, especially last year and, you know, most of this year, students are already dealing with enough of a change, taking everything virtual that having a dedicated platform for your music lessons helped sort of compartmentalize it to be like, oh, all my music stuff is on music. I don't need to worry about it getting messed up with my, you know, public school stuff. This is where it goes. This is what it's for. And, you know, that's where it will be. And totally. That's awesome. And I love the, didn't you say there's like a duet um, feature? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the duets are probably the number one complaint from teachers are, on any given you know video session, if I play something, there will be internet lag. No one can solve that. That is right. just a fact of life. But what you can do is clever workarounds. So one of the things that we created was we call it clips, but it's basically virtual duets where the student, well, the teacher can record their half of the duet. And then it will instantly send that recording to your student who can then hit play and play along with your recording. So the teacher can listen to the student's performance as a duet. And then the nice thing with those recordings is they get automatically saved to your student's account. So they can go and practice with those throughout the week. Yeah, and and as a teacher, they, these things all start building into a library. So over time, you'll have hundreds of clips of yourself playing all these parts or videos or full lesson recordings or just a big library of files. And so it becomes easier and easier as you go. So a teacher could use the same clip again over yep. and over. Like, yeah. oh, like that's even better because then they're yeah. not repeating themselves. Constantly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because, you know, if you yeah. did something with one student, you know, two days ago and you're doing the same topic, well, just grab the clip from last week and you're good to go. Exactly. And, that's incredible. And a big thing we've been working on recently, of course, is making it compatible for online lessons. Oh, uh, sorry. In-person lessons. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, it was originally designed for online. But now as people shift to in-person, every tool we have, the recording, the whiteboard, the files, the clips, everything is available for you to use with a student who's actually in person. So you can have someone sitting across from you, but you can still use the same file sharing system. You can still record your lessons. You can still do all of that. And everything still archives to the cloud so that that kid doesn't need a folder with all the material. They can't lose anything anymore. There's always going to be a digital copy of it. That's so, and then if they're ever sick or anything, they just hop back online and the continuity of your lessons continues. So it makes it much smoother experience for everyone. I love it. That's awesome. So I'll definitely include a link in the, you yeah, know, the show great. notes for people to try it out. Cause I think, I think it's just something, I mean, everyone's paying for zoom right now, but to have all those extra features and then not have to pay for like Dropbox and yep. all this other stuff, like that would streamline it. Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. And we do yeah. offer a free account for it's, per, you know, oh. always free. Um, it's basically just a really high quality audio video chat with a little chat box to save your lesson notes. Um, so if they, you know, if you want a low barrier to entry, uh, it's, oh, it's cool. free. So you can try it out and then yeah. like add the features later if they want. Yeah, pretty much. That's really cool. So, um, and so uh, now, so this is your family. It's a family business. Yep. So uh, yeah, still me and my dad. So that That's never cool. changed. Yeah. So from the first prototype back in college to now, it's still the two of us doing, you know, most of the work for it. It's, it's, it's become, and I, I kind of joke that we've been working together for like 15 years because when I was yeah. a kid, he was a drummer, I'm a guitar player. So when I'd come home from school, he used to work from home. So we'd have jam sessions after school every day. Okay. So I'd come home, we'd play for like an hour or so. And we sort of got, you know, really good at being able to communicate without actually saying anything. Yeah. So we just kind of carried that over. Yeah, exactly. And we just pushed it forward to this. And we, you know, 
we meet up once a week to kind of talk shop and get some ideas rolling. And then the rest of the time, we just kind of work independently to do what we need to do. Um, and it's been going really well. So I can't complain. <laughs> That's so awesome. So, you know, one thing I want to talk about is sort of some of the tech stuff, because you're obviously very savvy in the tech department. And I think a lot of musicians, including myself, like as I went into the entrepreneurial space, I had to figure out a lot of stuff about tech. And honestly, there's a lot of stuff that's still a huge mystery to me. So I'm sure a lot of listeners are like, yeah, (laughs) tech, that's a mystery to me. So um, I wanted to talk about, well, clearly it's kind of natural for you, but we were in our pre-talk, we were talking about two things, which I thought were really inspiring. One is the NFT idea, the (laughs) non-fungible token. So let's talk about that first, because I follow Gary Vaynerchuk online. I don't know Mm -hmm. if anyone's listening and they don't know who that is, check him out. Um, He's like the king of all entrepreneurs, I would say. (laughs) He's just like the leader of the entrepreneurship life. And he's been talking about NFTs. Actually, since he's been talking about it, I find it very interesting that Ethereum, which is the way this is, that's the yeah, like the, the coin or the mm-hmm. platform. And it's the currency that you can use to buy his particular NFTs that he's created. Mm-hmm. Now Ethereum has actually gone up a lot since he's been talking about that yep, in a time sense. when, in a time when other cryptos have been going down. Yep. So that's really interesting. I've started learning a lot about crypto just this year. So, um, so share with me what you think, because First of all, can you explain what that what a non fungible token is? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's it's a really interesting concept. So basically, it's ownership of a digital asset. So what that really means, and this is where it starts to get kind of confusing, is that mm-hmm. really what it is is like having a receipt to say that you bought something. Okay. Now, realistically, a non fungible token could be like a photograph. So you could have a picture. And everyone could go onto the internet and look at that picture and they could screenshot it. And now they have that picture. The difference is that you own the original and think of it like art. If we took the Mona Lisa, right. And we replaced the Mona Lisa with one of like a, like a poster or a copy of the Mona Lisa, right. And put that up in the same slot that the Mona Lisa lives in. Well, that's not the Mona Lisa anymore. And that doesn't hold the value for what it really is. So it's a little bit of, it's the the value we give it is the value it has. So they don't intrinsically actually have much value because you could have an NFT that is worth nothing, or you could have an NFT like Beeple that was worth $70 million. And so he's an artist. Okay. Um, So he, what he did was he creates digital art and he did the project basically where he would create one piece of art every single day. And he did it for 15 years. And then he put all of them into one big collage. And he sold that at Christie's auction house for 70 million or 69 point something million dollars. Okay. And Uh, that was an actual physical painting. No. So it's digital. So the whole thing was digital. Yeah. The whole thing is digital. So there's, there is no physical representation of that item in the, I mean, you could print it off, I guess, but it's, there is no canvas or anything for it, which is this where this is where they get confusing because yeah, because how do you enjoy the original? That's my question. Yeah, ex- that, that's exactly it. Is it's sort of like saying, you know, I own the Mona Lisa and it's hanging in my house, but you can also just have a picture of the Mona Lisa and hang it in your house. But right. I own the original, and okay. having an NFT is sort of like saying it's sort of just like a a receipt or like, a, or like, a, yeah, I guess a receipt is probably the best way of thinking of it to be like, I'm the owner of the original. So whether or not it's then shared out to other people for any other reason, they don't own the original. And that's where it starts getting dicey because it's, it's like, it's like fine art where you're saying, well, what makes that painting worth a hundred million dollars and the one next to it worth $50? Right. You know, they might look pretty much the same, but it's the value that we put on as a collective. Right. And so theoretically that Beeple piece of art could be worth nothing tomorrow because we, as a society decide that it's now worth nothing. So it, right. it's it, all about it. Like any kind of value is about agreements. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like we decided that this paper dollar represents yeah, $1, this is a, right? Exactly. So it's the same, but 
but like it's harder to kind of grasp if it's a yeah. digital thing but like maybe it's a little bit like i own the address to this bitcoin yes yeah the, it, but you could screenshot it, it and i could give you the screenshot but that's not worth anything because it's a screenshot of a bitcoin yeah that that's pretty right. much yeah that's yeah. pretty pretty close because it's basically and there are there are instances where when you buy an nft it like gets locked down in a way where like mm -hmm. nobody else can access it but then that's kind of silly that's like buying a famous painting and putting it in a vault it's like right. is that really what you wanted to do with it um, right but gary what he's doing vaynerchuk is making these tokens they're little drawings and they represent mm -hmm. like characters that he's created and then if you buy one it gets you into this in-person um, oh, you know, cool. Okay. So it's sort of like a, it's like a ticket. To yeah. Like a ticket. Okay. It's a ticket. Yeah. And it's an original ticket. And you know, right now it's kind of, who knows when there's going to be an in-person like massive yeah, right. conference. Right. Yeah. And that's what he's planning. And he said, it's, it's definitely happening. I don't know when, but you can buy these NFT tokens now. And then they di different levels represent different things. So like mm -hmm. if you buy this one certain one probably costs more, yep. um, you get like an hour of his time to, to sure. strategize your business or, or whatever, you know? So, um, so there's different kind of built in value within yeah. that token that's in real life too. Yeah, that makes sense. That That's a yeah. fantastic way of, of kind of bringing it back to the real world because right. a lot of the problem with like crypto and NFTs is that it feels too uh, ethereal in a way yes, where exactly. people are like, how do I actually get this? How do I, how do I how use do... it? How do I buy things? Yeah, right? and I exactly. Think that's the, I think for the longest time, I stayed stuck in that place. Like, well, if I don't understand the blockchain, then I shouldn't even look at what right. I consider. You know, right. and I don't think... I think if you Probably. wait till you understand it, you'll miss <laughs> the like, it. opportunity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like, I think if, I wish someone would have told me that when Bitcoin was like $10. Right. You don't need to understand the blockchain. Yeah, just, just buy do this it, thing. We said so. Just give me a hundred dollars right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Or it's like the guy who bought a pizza for one Bitcoin. So yeah. it's now technically the world's most expensive slice of pizza. <laughs> he bought a $40,000 pizza. Pretty much. Today. Um, but it's one of those things like, and it, it works similar to normal money in the sense that we all give it a community value. I like the idea of having something attached to it. And NFTs are not always one of one. So you can actually have multiple. So you could have like, like a, if back to fine art, if I made a painting and it's like one of 500, you might have number 430. So that is another avenue for artists or creators to sell something with like exclusivity rights to it without on all they have to do is just choose how many they want to sell. Uh, since it's digital. People doing that with music somehow? Well, so uh, Eminem actually just sold a backing or like a beat for a song as an NFT. And oh, really? so it sold for 200 and something thousand dollars. Now, theoretically, you could go online, you could rip that beat and you could make your own song. But it's in that we all know that, that you it's not yours. We know the guy who bought it. So we know that it's his. Mm. So that really gives it the value. Uh, there's a, a couple of other bands have done this where selling like an album as an NFT, where okay. everyone can buy the same album over and over and over again. But it's a back to sort of like having a record, right? Like you are the owner of that copy of the album. Okay. It, it, it's, it's, and it's, tricky because you know you well, could you can do <laughs> well then you can do that thing like god i've said this so many times on podcasts people are probably sick of it that esperanza spalding example <laughs> she only made seven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven copies of yep. an album right yeah, and, yeah so like you know that um if you have one of those yeah you, you have, have one it. yep and you that's stream it on spotify you can't yeah. i mean i yeah. suppose someone could Upload yeah, they, to... they could upload it to yeah. So that's the the weird. That's where it gets weird is that you yeah, could right. upload it to like YouTube or something and go and listen to the song. But it is the difference between me having the vinyl at home 
So, I mean, I, I actually literally do this. I have vinyls at home that then I just go and stream the album. <laughs> so really? yeah, it's sort of like too lazy to go and put it on the vinyl. Well, or if you're in your car, player. you can't play the vinyl. Yeah, exactly. So and yeah. my logic to that, this is kind of a side note, but my logic has always been buy the CD, throw the CD away and then stream it exclusively because they don't get paid every time you listen to the CD. They get mm-hmm. paid every time you stream the song. So if you want to support your favorite artist, buy their CD so the money goes directly to them. Then get rid of your CD and go open your Spotify or your title or whatever, and then stream it exclusively because then they're actually going to, yeah, it's pennies on the dollar, but now you're paying them twice for something. And if you really care about that artist, that's the best way you could possibly actually put back into their community. So it's sort of backwards but (laughs) i think the exclusivity piece is something that creators should really look at as a way to support themselves and it's funny because another podcast episode that i recently recorded um the example is that he's giving all of his music and his sheet music and everything for free in the public domain and that's like the opposite kind of viewpoint (laughs) i'm putting out there right now but um but like it kind of goes into the Patreon idea too. Like if you're, if you're an exclusive patron of this artist, then you're going to get maybe an improvised real time concert and it's going to happen once. Maybe you get the NFT of that. Well, I was just going to say, you could actually make this podcast an NFT if you wanted. Wait a second. Yeah. So yeah, so like you could you could make your podcasts NFTs that people could own the podcast kind of thing, oh, and then cool. yeah, so it's it's one of those things again. You I could, gotta hire you to help me. <laughs> yeah, it, it's honestly it's actually there's now there's now after you know a year or so of these being around, it's becoming really there's websites you can go to and just it's kind of like anything you just create an account, upload your content, put a price on it, and there you go. There's your NFT. And so it creates- maybe what we should do is like after the show exclusive content and that goes on the NFT. Yeah, you could do something like that. It, it's yeah. it's a really interesting concept because, they, but I think Mark Cuban has probably said it the best. He basically said, if you are buying NFTs because you think they're going to appreciate in value, don't. <laughs> because that's not the point. He's like, buy something because you want it and you like to own a collectible. Like okay. you want to have- the thing. It's kind of like baseball trading cards. Actually, uh, a video the other day of LeBron James slamming like a, a crazy dunk. The video is like a five second clip of him running, jumping and taking a dunk. That was sold as an NFT for like $200,000 as a virtual trading card. So the idea is that that's a virtual version of your old school trading card. Now, again, there's you could go to YouTube and watch that clip right now of him doing the dunk, but we all sort of know that somebody actually owns the original card. Whereas, like if you had Babe Ruth's rookie card, I've seen a photo of it, so right. therefore I've seen it. the card, but I don't own it. You know what I mean? So it's 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 a gray area mostly it is because, <laughs> because you can hold that card versus yeah. if you want to view the NFT, you have yeah to you still have to just. Screen. Yeah, and there are some there are some issues with NFTs though. It's not all great because uh, some of the problems are that they're held on servers. So what if the server crashes? So are, what they, are to, they like blockchain technology though? So mostly, but there's potential that you could lose access to the NFT itself if if we don't keep the infrastructure evolving as we go think of like a floppy disk right you could have had the most valuable thing in the world on a floppy disk what are you going to do with it now well i mean i actually have an actual example of that i had i did this um really cool um interview with my grandfather for a project in college and it and it the whole thing lives on this um on a cassette tape Oh, there you go. <laughs> and a, like, remember the Apple computer blue? It wasn't a floppy like this big, but it was yeah. a blue hard disk. Like the floppy yeah. was on the inside. That's yeah, yeah. where the, that's where the actual paper. That's exists. where it really is. So none of us are, li- I mean, I think my, my parents probably have a taper tape. Right. Deck. 
it's like 20 thing. steps though before you're going to be able to get that back if yeah like if that would be all. a cool thing to turn into an nft i guess yep. like i mean if especially if it was a famous person yeah oh absolutely and you know? and that's the thing is anything digital can be an nft anything a song a video a photograph uh yeah anything i mean technically a piece of software could probably be an nft um I'm not quite sure how that would really work, but. But then you can get into the area of, oh, now this is valuable and I can trade you this thing for this yeah. thing. So now it's a little bit like a currency too. Yeah, absolutely. And that, right. that's, but that's like also why. I rare coin and I'm going to yeah. trade you. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, and again, like I said, it's the ownership of the item. It's like having the receipt. So like, um, I heard an example recently was uh, like, if, if I bought a racehorse, uh, but the racehorse lives in Florida and I don't ever go to Florida, but I have the paperwork at home that says that I own this racehorse right. and he's like a famous racehorse. The paperwork is essentially what the NFT is, is to be like, <laughs> I own the, I've got the proof that this is mine. Uh, another neat kind of thing about NFTs is that typically they uh, continuously pay the original creator. So if, if, so like this Beeple one, he sold it for $70 million to, to some super rich guy. <laughs> Yeah. If the super rich guy sells that NFT to somebody else, Beeple will get paid again because oh. it, I think it's 10% actually will go back to the original creator of the work, which is a really interesting concept because that's not how real products work once right. it's sold and you can do whatever you want with it. Right. So this kind of brings in a new dynamic that people might not have thought about where theoretically you could take a single nft and sell it and sell it and sell it and sell it and just keep selling it and the original artist will continuously get paid sort of like streaming in a way it's like streaming the nft but it's every transaction they get a little bit of a kickback so i can see the appeal it's like royalties, to right like, yeah it is it's like royalty seinfeld on a yeah. network replay right or whatever yeah absolutely yeah. yeah so it's it's an interesting way for artists to sort of take the power back in a way because they you know it, like we talked about at the beginning is making music isn't really the best avenue anymore for actually making money but with things like this and i mean it if i was to go and throw an nft of a song i recorded this afternoon probably nobody would buy it so it's, you know, and so it doesn't, cause it doesn't have it's value okay. because I'm not a famous musician or anything. So right. it's, it's, you know, it doesn't hold that, that value, but you never know, like, you know, there's tons of famous painters who had no idea during their own lifetime that they were famous. It could be down the line, but it's that kind of thing where anyone could make an NFT. So it, it's, where's the value? And that's just the community decides. Right. So yeah. This is an interesting topic because it's such it's a weird. new concept. It's a new concept. And it, I, I like how it's full circle because it brings us back to that original conversation of like, how how does a creator get paid and how does a performer yep. get paid? And it, to me, it seems like the key word is creator. Yes. If you're a performer recreating someone else's, there's just not enough potential there for- yeah. I think that's fair. I don't think people are all that interested in reproductions. Um, I mean, you, you can see it in almost every aspect of, of the world. Um, I, like I like, I love history stuff. So I watch Pawn Stars all the time where they like bring in items oh, to yeah. sell off. And if it's a recreation, they don't want it, you know? Really? Yeah, they only want the originals. Uh, it's, it's, and that's because we've co collectively agreed that the creator is who we're buying into not the secondary creator who just ripped off the first guy. <laughs> like Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's like a kind of questionable thing in the classical space where you're just, you're, you are recreating because music is a thing that is heard mm -hmm. and that art form is in the moment. Yeah. You know, then it's, then you're listening to kind of a historical artifact, mm -hmm. but but then again, looking at the marketplace, like what's the majority of people putting their interest yeah. and time and money into, and it's going in that direction. So it's just really, really an interesting conversation to have. And so like one of the things I wanted to mention before we like wrap it up and invite everybody to check out Musi Live is the Minecraft thing I thought was so oh, yeah. cool because like, 
<laughs> my daughter is really into Minecraft. Another kind of tech thing that that is like out of my realm of yeah, just eluding most people. <laughs> yeah, but you like you went ahead and like dove down that rabbit hole since you had so many oh, yeah. students who are already always talking about it. Yeah, yeah. I've got. I would say any student between the age of ten and fifteen is wholly invested in Minecraft. Yeah, <laughs> like. To the point where, like, I grew up, I would say, like, in the golden age of video games, you know, when, like, Halo and Call of Duty and all that stuff was, like, at its peak. This is has blown all of those away by wow. 10 times. Because what you're seeing, what, what I love about Minecraft is that it's, a cre- it's creative. So it's not a game that is pre-made for you and you just follow a path. It's your, it's like Legos, but virtual. So you go in, you can build things, you can, like, I, it took me a long time to actually figure out how the game worked. So this is why I actually downloaded it and started playing it, because my students would be referencing things, like an ender dragon. I was like, what is, what, a dragon? Cool. Like, I, I don't understand. Yeah, you didn't um, want to be like that old guy. I yeah, <laughs> and, and like, I, I got like games and video games and stuff. So I was like, well, let's see what this is all about. And it's, it's genuinely fun. It's one of those really? things where... It, and I totally understood right away what it was they were getting out of it. Because like in the first few minutes of the game, you're sort of wandering around and you have no idea what's going on. And then you like start to realize that you can like dig a hole. And when you dig a hole, you now have dirt. So then like I walked up to a tree and you like hit the tree. And then after a few seconds, you'd have wood. And then you could go around and you start collecting resources. And then you combine the resources to make things. And so, you know, if you have a piece of wood, you can turn it into like a boat. You can get enough pieces of wood, make a boat, and then you can go sail off into the ocean. You can go collect string and more wood and make a fishing rod. And you can then fish and you can get a fish. You can eat the fish. You, and so like it's it builds on top of itself in a really creative way. Um, and yeah, my students are obsessed with it. So they were always talking about it and telling me like, you know, their new like skins or like outfits. So like they'd have new skins and new things and all this. So I, and to still be the cool teacher, I was like, okay, I got to like download this and actually figure out how to play it. Yeah. Yeah, Um, exactly. And I, to be honest, I enjoy it. Like it's, I have no time to actually like actively play, but it's the kind of thing where I can see myself in, you know, with, with a bit of free time hopping on and doing that. And it's a much more constructive thing than a lot of the older video or you know there's still those games out there but it's not just a shooting game right you're not just going around trying to kill each other there's there's a mission at at heart like you're going on an adventure you're exploring places you're trying to build things and there's a lot of teamwork involved so and and 2020 was sort of the year of not being able to go near your friends so all of these kids have a headset and they'll they will organize they'll be like okay at five o'clock we're all going to meet up and meet me by the big oak tree, you know, (laughs) it's now the digital oak tree and they'll all actually show up there and they'll have their headsets on and they'll like talk through their plan and they'll actually go out and like complete a mission together. And I I just thought it was such an, an awesome way for people to keep interacting and keep playing. And instead of it being a game that's destructive, it's constructive. So I, I thought that was really, really neat. And every kid is obsessed with it. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's like the highest selling game in history now or, or really? yeah, up at the very top. Um, so do you still play it? A little bit. Like I'm, I'm like, I will play like 20 minutes here and there. Yeah. I'm terrible at it. It's one yeah. of those games that like the kids are a thousand times better than I am. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because it's gotten some of my students interested in other things like one of my students was telling me about this uh, product. I can't remember what the name was, but he, he it basically it speeds up the frames per second on your computer so that the game runs more smoothly. And it was like, it's a completely separate thing from video games. It's now we're talking like internal computer technology and frame rates. And, and he's 11 years old and he's like, oh, well, you, you do these settings and you change this and now your frame rate's going to be this. And I was like, well, this is fantastic because <laughs> like, this is exactly what you want to be seeing is that they take an interest in something and then really run with it. 
And so I, I just, I, I think it's great. And, and it is pretty fun. It's, <laughs> it's Legos basically. And I love Legos. So, but it's <laughs> deep, so, cool. so you don't have to worry about stepping on them. <laughs> well, I have to, exactly. That's the biggest <laughs> problem with Legos. Um, I, I appreciate your point of view on it because, um, you know, when your kids start, like, I'm not a gamer, never have mm-hmm. been. I mean, I'm uh, much older than you. It was Atari back back when I yeah. was <laughs> like Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and stuff. So like um, the fact that my daughter's so into it, like it really helps me actually to know that maybe it's, it's like, it's an educational thing and it's constructive. Yeah. And especially that, that cool thing about like computer technology. I mean, that's anything that's going to get someone up to speed on technology in yeah. my book is, is pretty important. So I, I love that. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation and yeah, me so too. people can check out, um, Musy live just it's yep. just musy.live right yep yeah no yeah just musy.live and it'll it'll show up okay cool i'll put the link in the show notes cool. and yeah and then people can check it out because i think it's a super cool platform and yeah thanks for being on the show today awesome yeah thank you so much for having me it's been a lot of fun great